any reflections from your discussions um, that you'd like to share in plenary? We were able to answer uh, question three first. What should we do? What we need to do as donor community and as platform? First, take more risk. Think out of the box. Second, pay more attention to uh, political sciences, to politicians. Because uh, part of the solution uh, to deal with the complexity is not in the conception of our own pro uh, project, the way action, but it, it relies definitively in the uh, political system and in the policies of our partner uh, countries. Um, and uh, so we discussed around the uh, proposal of Professor Swaminathan to consider that uh, uh, dealing with rural development is just as uh, directing a uh, symphony orchestra where uh, the instrument uh, players are all the local actors uh, at different level. So the question is, who is going to be the director of, of the orchestra? Uh, definitely not the donor, uh, most probably uh, uh, a, a politician at local level. And this is why the, the example of uh, a PNDP in Cameroon seems to us very uh, relevant to uh, deal with the complexity which we should acknowledge, accept, uh, consider uh, at the local level doesn't mean that we have to build complex project. Let's trust in our partner, in their institution, and in the case of uh, uh, PNDP, to the Myers. Uh, and this is something very new compared to what we experiment during the, the, the 30 years ago through the integrated um, uh, approach of rural development. Uh, and maybe the last idea is uh, let's think of uh, uh, redevability, I don't know, ac accountability. Uh, it's, it's all under three. Because yeah. uh, the risk of to <laughs> trying to answer the question one uh, was uh, uh, if we answer no, it's not relevant, well, we will have stop. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, Jean-Luc. <laughs> thank you. So more risk-taking. Let's think more about the politics. Let's think about the role of the politicians. Would any other um, groups like to add to that? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lindsay Wallace from the MasterCard Foundation. We had a very good discussion. We thought it was very relevant to answer question one uh, to, to our work. Um, and it's a really important lens that we should view development through, however. Uh, we recognize there are a lot of challenges. Um, there was a discussion how new theories of change are, are almost simplifying things a bit too much. Um, the issue of accountability came up. Uh, you know, we need to be accountable in terms of targets, in terms of to the auditors, um, you know, even external reviewers. And then also the issue of ownership that sometimes um, can come up in relation to this. Uh, so it, it's relevant, but we had some challenges with um, practically applying it to the work that we do. Um, in terms, then we, we then had a very interesting discussion about how we're really actually part of the problem. Um, in that, you know, there's, was a whether or not this is yet another new trend. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of new initiatives that keep coming in and, and, you know, is this another new thing that we're gonna just all run to? And in terms of answering um, question three related to that, is that perhaps a role for the platform is to do some lessons learning building upon previous types of approaches, um, similar approaches that have been done. What, what worked, what didn't work? How can we kind of build off that to, to start afresh and, and build upon um, existing knowledge? And I don't know if there was any, anything else that anyone wanted to add, but, so, but it was a, a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add? Yes, please, Lynn. I guess seeing as nobody's gone towards question two, um, one of the things we actually did think applied to question two was that many of the members of the platform are actually funders of the consultative group on international agricultural research, mm. which is 15 centers doing sort of public good research in agriculture, but which, fun which functioned as 15 independent centers being funded by individual donors, and that now that has come together as a system with the, the funders to identify strategic research in agriculture that's more linked up. So it's a much more thinking of the systems type approach. 
I mean, it's a reforming process. So I think everybody's learning the complexity of trying to do the reform, but it is one that's moving forward and it's very much a systems thinking as opposed to an individual center and donor thinking. Uh, just to stimulate the debate a bit, I will, uh, I will be a bit more extreme than maybe the discussion group was because it was much more balanced, but since everybody answered question one with a clear yes, uh, we had some sort of doubts if, if it's not a no. <laughs> uh, and the doubts about the relevance was, um, even if us here, who are more on a, on a working level, uh, think that it's a very good system to be applied, we wondered um, if we can convince our politicians and our hierarchy about it, uh, if we were able to do it. And there were doubts about uh, basically three things. First is, there is a big hype on results and everybody wants to have these results communicated clearly to the taxpayers and uh, in combination with the way how we are getting there. So you said you do either or, uh, but normally uh, our politicians ask or, or our, our ministers ask us to do both. Um, second is uh, the time pressure that we are normally not ready to say uh, if it takes 20 years, it takes 20 years, though we know that it will take 20 years, but no one has the courage to say so. So maybe it's a question about courage, but again, this is not for us to be courageous. It would be for the minister to be courageous, and he has a different uh, mindset. Uh, third thing was um, that generally donors have this tendency of wanting to be uh, hands-on, uh, and what they would need is to back off, um, and that this is something which is also not very um, often done or not allowed in our systems. Um, the discussion was a bit more balanced, but I made it a bit more... Easy, uh, easy and simplistic and simplified <laughs> in order to reduce complex discussions. <laughs> Thank you. Philippe Utina from, from CIRAD. We, uh, in our group, we, we didn't have many members of the GDPR, the other platform. We had our colleague from the, the Dutch Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs, but, but we are over dominated by, by scientists and researchers from IFPRI and IRD and, and CIRAD. So maybe <laughs> we, we do not really fit within the the questions, but anyway, just just um, maybe f uh, five main ideas. The first one was we we very liked in the presentation uh, the highlight was made on the dependency pathways and the locked in because this is very much something that we have to recognize and that we also as scientists recognize that the way we think, we, the way we look at what we are doing is very much dependent on sort of paradigm that we have have been imposed on us. And, and the evolution of a bicycle was very much a good example of we are not thinking outside what could be uh, not a bicycle, but something else that would play the same role. Um, so the, this idea of locked in is, was, was important. Uh, the second one where we insisted was the, the political dimension is not only from the donor perspective, but there is a lot of political dimension at all levels, including locally. There's a lot of politics involved in, in the uh, role, uh, uh, in the territorial approach, it's, it's actually uh, policy and, and political issues which are being de debated there, so we should not for forget that aspect. Uh, we also discussed a lot uh, about impact and how we can uh, reconcile the, the need to be humble, know what we know and what we don't know, but also come up with something to tell the taxpayers, but also something to tell the uh, actors on the ground. It's not only the taxpayers, it's also the people who are involved and putting some of their resources, some of their efforts, some, some of their strength into a dynamic. So what is the message we, we, uh, we bring to them? Uh, there was a proposal to, um, uh, from a research perspective to highlight uh, long-term ex post uh, analysis that, that do show that maybe we didn't know where we were, were going, but in fact, uh, the knowledge, the capacity development, did has uh, have an impact on what has happened and has, has paved the way for for some growth or some evolutions. So that's that's positive. Um, and the, the last uh, element was um, we have to be careful about language. Uh, the mean words do not mean the same for uh, for the different people, especially when we are talking about mutual understanding between stakeholders. Even mutual understanding between scientists from different fields mm. who do not understand the same meaning behind the words. So, I mean, the attention to language is probably key to the success in the uh, territorial development approach. <coughs> Thank you. Arne O'Cleary from Irish Aid again. I think, uh, well, we had a, a discussion which didn't come to uh, a synthesis or consensus, I think, in the end, but um, some of the points that 
came up maybe were I I kind of in response to one and two. I think that uh, certainly from Irish Aid's point of view, I would have difficulty in recognizing um, the Newtonian reductionist approach uh, uh, in, in the way we think about development and the way we plan and manage and monitor and engage with, with, uh, uh, with programs and with development processes. So in a sense, um, I, I think the problem statement perhaps is a, uh, that was put forward is, is a bit overstated. And the other thing I think is, is that I don't, I, I think there's a doubt about whether the poor performance on rural development and the poor performance on poverty reduction and ongoing high levels of poverty, ongoing exclusion of people, is that really driven by an, inad an inadequate conceptual or analytical framework of what's going on? Uh, and probably not. It's driven by some of the issues that were definitely raised in the presentation. Power inequality, exclusion from economic opportunity, lack of access to resources, lack of access to political power, political representations, driven by all of those things. And the question would be, is, is, a, new, um, is a new conceptual framework, a new analytical framework going to change that? So what seems to be a bit unconvincing in, in, in the presentation is how would this, this new understanding actually produce change in terms of policies and decisions. If you, the, that, that um, uh, economic atlas image uh, was, a v was a very interesting, very useful one potentially, but you don't really need that to know that um, you know, a focus on extractive industries uh, isn't actually going to do much for for the livelihoods of poor people, you know, and uh, I I stimulating investment in agro processing might be might be a better way to go. Uh, and, and, and if you e and even knowing that, is that going to change the policies that resulted in 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 in, in rent seeking around extractive industries, um, or not? Um, so I, I think, though, that the presentation raised lots of the things that are necessary to look at and to do if we're going to be engaged in local development, district level development. So things around political economy analysis, stakeholder analysis, working on power inequalities and, and trying to change them, supporting poor people's organizations, uh, small, small producers' organizations, changing power relations in markets, all of those sorts of things. But I have to say they are things we work on, uh, on, on, on already. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Let's have a final comment from, from Brian, please. Yeah, thanks. We had a small group of, with Denmark, with Austria, with IFAD, and with, with the Cameroons. We were looking at the, the relevance of the way of thinking. We talked a little bit about the territorial thinking, and we felt to some extent, and don't take this the wrong, the wrong way, but was this old wine in new bottles? That we have been doing watershed development for and systems approaches for, for some time now. And we have recognized the role of, of the various actors. So we felt that this is an elaboration of, of the way that we are thinking. And in the context of, the, of the, the previous presentations, discussions about international cooperation, what we did found as a missing piece was the whole work of the Paris Declaration, Accra and Busan. We don't talk about international cooperation. We talk about country ownership. And what we felt the last presentation and the way that the platform is thinking and we are members are thinking is what does a country want to do? What do the elected people's groups, as the Cameroons say and the local mayor, what do they want to do? That is guiding the way that we need to support rural development. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, so, Ben, I'd like to invite you up to the podium again. I think, um, broadly speaking, yes, it is relevant. Um, we are doing some of this already. There are some big questions, some big challenges like accountability, own, um, timing. Um, you have the final 10 minutes of the session to, Great. to address some and of I've those. I've been scribbling some thoughts madly. Well, I guess the first thing I want to repeat is I'm not saying complexity is a silver bullet. Uh, that would be counter to uh, the whole idea, really. Um, and I think it's also really important to note that there's been some really important examples. We heard Julio talking uh, earlier on about the mosaic of development <coughs> dynamics and outcomes in Brazil and other countries. Uh, we heard the conclusions around the Bruno talking about the need to engage in new rural urban transitions and the need to engage with really highly localized patterns and processes. And Estrine talking about the need to use data and mapping to move beyond cookie cutter approaches and to engage more holistically with process of development. 
we heard all the case studies. We've heard some of the examples that people are talking about just now. The, um, the need to engage with uh, political systems, the need to move away from these imposed paradigms. Uh, and I think, I think fundamentally it comes down to this, that actually there's a lot of work that's already going on that uses these principles, uses these ideas, that nods to this stuff. But actually the overwhelming, and, and it may well be that uh, the very comprehensive critique from, my, uh, from the, our Irish colleague that both my presentation of the problem and the presentation of the answer was, was flawed, which, thank you for that. that was <laughs> I'll, I'll think of that as I'm going to bed tonight. Um, but uh, I, I, think, I think I have to come back and say, actually, I, I think it may well be easier for organisations to... Um, essentially acknowledge that this is what they're already doing. And that, that means that they don't have to question our ways of thinking at all. What, I, what, I've, what I'm trying to do is actually present a, a challenge to the way in which we all think, we all institutionally think and operate. And I think uh, I'd be really interested to see whether or not Irish Shade actually is free of this way of thinking or whether your organisation would come back and, if I was to speak to people within it, actually recognise some of this. We're, we are constantly in the, in the situation of trying to take wicked problems that we know are out there, that we find difficult, and tame them in different ways and make them more controllable. And I, I'm not saying that's the only problem. But I think actually part of, the, part of the reason why you missed out on spiraling inequality, the financial crisis, uh, these other big trends that happen is because we are so focused inside the box. And I think it, what these tools do offer us is a way of thinking outside of the box. Um, and I guess there's two specific things I want to kind of talk about. One is um, this isn't just an issue for the development sector. So there was a big survey. IBM every year does a big survey of chief executives in the corporate world. And in 2010, they did a big survey of, it was the leading FTSE 100, Fortune 500 CEOs. And the single biggest issue identified by the chief executives was what they called the complexity gap. They said there's a, there's a gap between the complexity of the world that we're dealing with and the turbulence and the uncertainty of the world that we're dealing with, and the tools that we have and the processes that we have that enable us to engage with that. And that gap they only saw as being widening in the years to come and they didn't know how they were going to resolve that, what tools, methods, processes they were going to engage with. In fact, it was such a significant issue for the corporate sector that last year the Drucker Forum, which is like the, uh, the World Economic Forum equi uh, equivalent for management, was on the topic of managing and navigating complexity. And there, the opinions there differed. There were some CEOs, and they were, these were generally of the industries. Um, one of the ones that was representative was Tupperware, the, the pr producers of ca cartons and so on. And there were others that were much more around services and IT and all the rest of it. And some of them said, we can put, put the complexity genie back in the bottle. We can somehow stuff it all away. We can do things to, to, to ignore the complexity and carry on with what we're doing and make sure that we just focus on our results. And there were others that were saying, that's, that's just <laughs> completely wrong-headed. You can't just imagine all of this stuff away. It's going on. We need to try and navigate it. And that's where I think we kind of find ourselves. We've got the one part, the, the kind of, well, we should be carrying on with business as usual, or we should be trying to navigate this whole new way of doing things. And the reality is there are people that do this kind of thing all the time. There are professional risk managers. There are people that look at investments based on a portfolio approach and say there are some things which are low risk, which we are going to do predictable, reliable things in, in Newtonian ways. And there are other things where we need to be much more experimental. So I think the, the calculus around this, uh, the, the fact that risk itself and development has become politicized to the fact that we have to minimize any communication of risk is really challenging. We have to be able to say, like any portfolio manager working in the private sector or anyone working with a portfolio of experiments or investments, we've got some things which we can guarantee will are likely to succeed and we can do low cost interventions, Jeff Sachs and MDG campaign style stuff to solve that. But there are other problems that we're facing and I would argue that territorial development uh, in the rural settings is one of them, where actually we need a completely different way of thinking about risk. And, and we need to be able to experiment, we need to be able to challenge the way that we do things. And these tools can help. They, the, I think the tools are at an early stage I think this is something that I, uh, it's really important to highlight, and this is something we go into length uh, in, in the book, is that it's, it, these tools are a little bit like game theory was in the 1940s and 1950s, a new idea, a new tool, a new approach that was being used, 
And today, game theory is being used to do all kinds of things, shape procurement processes, inform the way in which government sets up contracts and so on. And it, but it's also become internalised into decision making. So there are rules of thumb that we can develop around game theory that you don't need to know the ins and outs of game theory to be able to utilise that. And I think we're at the start of this process with complex systems, that there are some rules of thumb that we can apply to the way in which we do management from complex systems. Like um, Dave Snowden talks about the need for multiple parallel experiments uh, and to work on a sense probe and respond so you sense what's going on from your um, a probe you, you put out probes which are your experiments you sense what's going on and you respond by scaling up and scaling down so you work in, in effect like a like a stock market investment manager but we don't always apply those very simple principles and rules of thumb in the way that we do things and if, when we sell these ideas within our organizations i think it's those rules of thumb we should be echoing not necessarily the underlying theory is that we need to find different ways of dealing with with wicked problems. Um, I think the idea that, um, and again, just to echo Bruno, that I think if donors can engage with this stuff, if they can engage with the reality of, of politics, of networks, of behaviours, of incentives, if, they c if they're willing to support uh, national uh, governments to and <coughs> local governments to do this stuff in territorial approaches, then I think that's great. But if you can't do that, then you should get out of the way or find other ways of supporting it. Um, I, I guess stepping back, I guess uh, on a macro level and maybe beyond the conversations, if we just look back, I mean, we're now 2014, 2000, what were we thinking would be happening in 2014? We probably thought we'd be heading towards the end of the MDGs like a, like a steam train. Uh, we probably had all kinds of assumptions about development, about poverty reduction, about human rights. And it's clear that any of the assumptions that we had about progress in these areas were, were, were basically incorrect. We assumed that the world was going to be a lot more predictable, a lot more reliable. We weren't in any way ready for the depth of impacts from things like climate change or the financial crisis or the food price crisis. And it, all of these have been amplified by the increasing in interconnectedness of the global system. And so the world that we live in today is not what we expected to be living in 10 or 20 years ago. It's characterised by unpredictability and uncertainty and new vulnerabilities and new opportunities. And so I think from a public policy perspective, it's actually the most important thing we need in the face of that are new ways of thinking. I think to deny that is to, I think, try and put the genie back into the bottle. I think we're, ne we're going to need new ways of thinking and new ways of acting if we're going to collectively navigate the turbulent years ahead of us, and not just in development, in, in our gl on our planet. And then some major problems that we basically can't solve using the tools and the mindsets that we've inherited. And I think this is partly what complex systems gives us. It's not the only thing that gives us these things, but it, I think what, what the complexity agenda does, it actually highlights that the, you, you have to be able to understand and navigate complexity. You can't simply ignore it. If you've got a model that already does it, great, well done. But I think there's a lot of, there's a large amount of development which isn't scientific in that sense. Therefore, it isn't relevant and it isn't appropriate. And I think we need to be able to, if we're, if we're going to be fulfill our promise to poor and vulnerable people in the world, we need to be able to follow that path to actually say we need to be more scientific and more realistic about what we do. And I guess, you know, that on a more positive note, I think it's really heartening that a group of influential, and serious people are taking these ideas seriously. And I think there's two things for you to think about going forward. I think there's a research agenda here to make sure that in the territorial approach, the, the, uh, the, the policy doesn't run a too far ahead of the science, that you don't, in, in, in ways that um, we've seen before in rural development and in development in general, that we, we need to make sure that we, we ground this in knowledge and evidence. And there's a policy and practice agenda as well, that we apply principles that are suited to the problem, that we don't apply principles that we've inherited from failures in the past. And we have to remember the politics and the dynamics of the politics. We cannot treat this as a technical issue. Um, I guess, let me finish with, um, uh, it's uh, one of my favorite quotes from Winston Churchill. He said, success is a matter of moving from failure to failure with energy and enthusiasm. <laughs> um, and if I was gonna be a little bit, um, uh, mischievous, I'd say, in rural development, we're at least half the way there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be standing here and to, uh, let me say, have the privilege of trying to 
come to some conclusion after such a rich and inspiring day with good presenters, with lots of interesting discussions. I can, I can assure you I'm not convinced that I can adequately do justice to the wealth of ideas and inspiration that has come out of the presentations and discussions throughout the whole day. I think what's more important is that we as individuals, as professionals, as a platform, and as partners for rural development have the courage to think about changing our institutions and the way we do, we do business. It's a bit of a question to the, an answer to a part of the no, which we had during the last session. Um, are we prepared to, to think out of the box? Are we prepared to take these complexities into account as we move our institutions along towards a better way of functioning? I think also that we shouldn't forget that the ultimate objective of the work that we are doing is to engage in such a way that we improve and sustainably improve the lives and livelihoods of poor rural people and communities throughout the world. Um, having said that, I will make my feeble attempt at trying to uh, present a number of conclusions. I realize that a lot gets lost at the end of the day in conclusions, but uh, I'm hoping that everyone will take home more with them than we can present in these few minutes. So during the sessions and throughout the sessions, we, we asked a number of questions. And um, uh, we'd like to focus on these specific questions uh, in the conclusions. We said, first of all, why are territorial approaches important? They're important. It's important to take this step to territorial approaches because rural societies are very complex. Human development is uneven, <coughs> and inequalities are persisting. Territories are changing. The whole landscape is changing. Among others, there's a new rural-urban development model that is needed because of these linkages between the rural space and the urban spaces. There are new relations which demand new partnerships. Governments and donors are often sector-based, and we all, some of us who have been in this business for quite some time, know everything about sectoral approaches, and spatially blind. And food, and, uh, food security and nutrition is a multi-sectoral, multi-actor, multi-level issue, and needs the four eyes, as mentioned today. The institution, attention for institutions, for information, for innovation, and for inclusion. The second question which we wanted to address is how do territorial approaches compare with other complementary approaches in rural development? I think this was a part of the final discussion as well. Are we talking about something different from the way we di we've been doing things for the past few years? The question which we would like to ask as a platform is whether the territorial approach or whether in any situation that we want to engage in is whether the territorial approach is fit for purpose. Um, the dichotomy between, let's say, um, spatial or sector-based approaches, um, the question we're raising is, is this, uh, is this wrong or I are they very much complementary approaches? The new realities, I think it was mentioned just now by Ben, Sorry, I'm blocking your view. Um, maybe I should stand here. <laughs> uh, let's say the, uh, the new realities um, of uh, that a number of them were mentioned today, the diversity, the questions of social inclusion, the governance issues, the issues related to growth and development, rural urban linkages, and new ways that all of these things connect to each other need to be taken account, into account. And a territorial approach may allow us to uh, be more uh, responsive to these new realities. And then leading to new development dynamics. But just linking into the last discussion, I think it's important to go back to the question of how do we need to change our own institutions to, to m be able to have an adequate response. Then we had four case studies. From the Cameroon case study, I think we, the message we, that was coming across very clearly 
was please don't forget to apply the Paris Declaration and, and coordinate among yourselves as donors. Um, the national program uh, uh, was presented. It supports decentralized financing mechanisms and the decentralized processes in Cameroon, and it cannot succeed unless the donors harmonize around this and link to the national strategies. The GIZ KFW example on integrated coastal zone management underscored the need for cross-sectoral and holistic approaches and should be linked to rural development. Scaling up, the message we were getting from that case study is that scaling up depends on political will and vision. The fourth one from the World Bank is that communities need to fully recognize that safeguarding public goods and accept financial obligations when aiming for increased rural incomes means that transformation, a real transformation, needs behavioral change. And the last one from our Austrian colleagues was that presenting, let's say, an, uh, an, a new nexus linking land, water, and energy by including, let's say, these aspects that we were discussing previously of thinking out of the box, thinking not just within that square, but thinking also within the circle that is around that square. We also need to change the policy dialogue. The fourth question that we wanted to address is what does a systems thinking approach offer? Our conclusions were it, uh, it allows us to recognize cognitive and operational bias in aid. It allows us to look at systems, networks, behavior, and dynamics. It allows us to be wary of simple and fast solutions. It should allow us to include the political economy in our thinking about development issues. It challenges us to transform long-held assumptions. And maybe, last but not least, we might want to buy a torch if we're looking for our keys. <laughs> the fifth question is what does this way of thinking highlight as key priorities for donors in supporting rural development? We're gradually moving towards our looking at our own role. Complexity is not new. A number of people stated that very clearly in the last discussion, but we do need to change our way of working to address the remaining challenge, challenges. Changing the donor business model, difficult issue for some of us. We need to change it to embrace how development results are achieved through these systems, these networks, through adaptive behavior that we see in the field, and through nonlinear dynamics. The last question we're putting to the group is, are agency, aid agencies capable of evolving to address these complexities, with the risk that if we don't do that, we might become irrelevant? Just a few scenes from today's sessions. Um, maybe for those of us who may be leaving us this evening after, of course, after the ideas market, um, as a platform, we are very, very committed towards bringing these ideas forward, responding to some of the challenges, which include trying to, uh, 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 trying to develop some lessons learned and see how we can move forward as a platform on the ideas that have been presented today. So I'd like to thank you very much for all of your contributions. And I hope that you all will go back home or stay here tomorrow, just as inspired as I am, to try to change my institution, to try to change their way of thinking, to get them out of this square box and into the circle, outside of the box. So um, thank you very much.